uh, J.P. Spiro here um, has done a number of our reading groups, most recently in Alan Bloom's Closing of the American Mind, last year on Machiavelli's Discourses. Uh, uh, Dr. Satterfield has done reading groups on, um, let's see, on Cicero, and what else? Oh yes, uh, this semester on heroes, on heroes, and so different people are presenting their heroes or anti-heroes. And um, we also support the Pursuit of Excellence Learning Community, as well as have uh, a student group of graduates and undergraduate Ryan Fellows. So if you're interested <coughs> at all in what we do or want to uh, check us out more, come on over to Old Halsey, uh, 304. Um, and if you like, uh, fill out a short but pertinent application and we'll in invite you to become part of our merry band of brothers and sisters. Uh, outside, Brenda has a, a sign-up sheet for anybody who wants to be on our mailing list to, um, to hear about the events uh, so you can be invited to those if you'd like to attend. I am very privileged today to introduce our speaker, Mr. Henry Olson. Uh, Henry is uh, a very dear, old in terms of length of time, obviously, friend of mine. I knew Henry when he was an undergraduate at Claremont McKenna College, and I was only slightly older as a graduate student at um, Claremont Graduate School. And I had to uh, work my way through school, so I got this job at a place called the Rose Institute of State and Local Government. And one of the things they did was redistricting. They were the leaders, probably in the nation, certainly in California, I think in the nation, they were on the cutting edge of technology for how to redistrict when a census comes up every 10 years and you can get your side in and keep as many of the other side out because that's what, of course, what people do when they redistrict. They gerrymander. And so um, I worked there in this math room and supervised these people, but I wanted to find out what was really going on there. And it turned out there was this room you had to be led to the back and get somebody to unlock it. It's a huge computer called the Redis system. You know, computers in those days were huge. <laughs> like what you see in, in the movies that you don't remember, you're too young. And um, so I thought the director of the center, um, this professor with a very strong uh, English accent, probably masterminded this whole thing. Well, lo and behold, he wasn't quite sure how the whole system worked. It was this undergraduate student who masterminded it all. So I got introduced to him. His name was Henry Olson. And since then, uh, Henry sh brought me in the, the room, showed me how the whole Reddit system worked, asked me who I wanted in Congress, and we could set it up and we could make things happen, um, theoretically. So then uh, Henry um, finished his undergraduate degree, went on to, uh, uh, well, he worked in politics for a while in consulting went to, then went to uh, University of Chicago Law School, got his degree, came back to Philadelphia and uh, practiced law at one of the major firms in the city, Decker, Price and Rhodes. And um, that wasn't enough to keep him busy, so he encouraged me to run for office. <laughs> so he became my consultant and we engaged in a few campaigns together. And I learned a lot about politics during those years because political science, as it's taught in the university, doesn't necessarily teach you what is most important about politics, unless you are fortunate to have um, good teachers. Henry Olson is vice president of the American Enterprise Institute and director of AEI's National Research Initiative. Now, what he essentially does is oversee virtually all of the domestic policy agenda. Uh, which includes um, financial markets, education, legal, retirement and aging, health policy, and uh, research programs. He's a regular participant in AEI's election watch series <coughs> and has written um, uh, articles and works that have been featured in such publications as the Wall Street Journal, the Weekly Standard, the Washington Times, and National Review. Uh, in, particularly, in particular, in the last election cycle, everyone called the election incorrectly. Mr. Olson was the one that got it almost perfect. He was off on one state, the state that it took him days and days and days to call because nobody was quite sure which way it would go in Florida. Um, 
After University of Chicago, Mr. Olson clerked for Judge Danny Boggs. Um, and I mention that because he did something interesting a few years ago. Uh, let me just stop for a minute, because we actually, this really is about politics. We have entering uh, an illustrious political figure, uh, Senator Baker. And I want to point out. Uh, Good to see you. The, uh, the back row here, uh, Athen Kutsurumbis, is a graduate of Villanova University and is now actively involved in all kinds of things in politics, mm -hmm. working right now with a uh, congressman of our, of our commonwealth. So Henry Cloak, uh, clerked with Judge Danny Boggs, and he happened to make an interesting phone call at one point to Judge Boggs, because Henry was on that show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, a few years ago. <laughs> and it's on YouTube. You have to look this up. It is so much fun. It is wonderful. Um, I won't tell you how far he got. You can look it up and see. But I will tell you that the, the question that he, uh, the last question he was asked, and only an academic can find this a bit odd of a question, how many stooges were there in the Three Stooges? <laughs> how many what? actors played in the comedy trio, the Three Stooges? You never correct. forget that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also want to introduce to you one of the people who's been a huge support uh, to us here at the Ryan Center and is also a Villanova graduate, Mr. Fred Anton. And Fred, thank you very much for all that you do to um, help us carry on these programs at Villanova. So without further ado, let me introduce to you Mr. Henry Olson. Thank you, Colleen. It's um, worth noting what you didn't include, which was uh, my attempt to present myself to the voters of California in, uh, at the age of 24. Uh, which they wisely decided I needed more seasoning. Um, I could not apply my magic arts to myself. Um, I'd also like to thank my teachers who are here, Bill Allen, Colleen, who are my formal teachers, uh, Fred Anton, who was one of the people who gave me my start in my current career in think tankdom when I left uh, the practice of law and became president of the Commonwealth Foundation. Fred was one of the people who uh, decided to hire me, and I'm always eternally grateful for that because it's been 18 years of bliss doing something I care about rather than doing document discovery. Um, I look forward to working with you, Athen. I know I'm four months late, but I think you'll see that I've been doing some thinking about the topics that we've talked about. <laughs> um, entitled to talk New Century, New Deal, uh, because my thesis is that uh, while American politics uh, is relatively uh, variable, it also is relatively stagnant in the sense that for over 200 years, if you look at American politics, parties come and go, issues come and go, coalitions come and go, but certain American values seem to remain constant. That most political coalitions that succeed over the long term in a national election is one, are ones that clearly have at their heart uh, the advancement of the individual, not in a paternalistic way in the sense of a European or a despotic state, nor in a purely libertarian way, as one might get from a seminar in uh, von Mises or from the Institute of Humane Studies, but rather in a very uniquely American way that's both free, involves both self-government in the individual level and self-government through the collective level, something that was intended to be such by the American founders, something that uniquely among America has remained the central question of virtually every important campaign on a national level for 225 years. And that question is, how can we best apply America's principles that the average person should be given respect and value and an opportunity to make their way in the world, tyrannized neither by people claiming the rule of law but acting in private interest, or people claiming the public interest uh, directly uh, and tyrannizing them explicitly for their own private interest. Indirect tyranny and direct tyranny. That, in a sense, was again what the 2012 election was fought over. It was fought over a question of whose vision for America best applies that principle to today's circumstances in a way that resonates with today's electorate, and as such, whose coalition is going to form around that and consequently enact a series of policies that will enact that vision. Obama's record and the Democrats' record was clear. They'd had ex uh, power from 2009 to 2010. They passed a number of land-breaking acts. 
They passed a number of land breaking legislation. They had a clear rhetoric. Anyone could judge what their vision was of and, of and for themselves. So what the Obama campaign did was what any campaign in those circumstances would do, especially since going into the early part of 2012 and after the 2010 election, there was not a clear majority that endorsed that record or that rhetoric or their direction. What they did was they asked, well, who do you like better? What about the other guy? And they spent months talking effectively about what the GOP alternative was. Would you prefer the Republican alternative as exemplified by the candidacy of Mitt Romney and the actions that they have proposed in Congress and on the stump? Now, one would have thought that this would have been a debate that would have been actively joined. Anyone who followed the campaign knows that you would be cruelly disappointed. In fact, from the moment that Rick Santorum dropped out until the moment of the Republican convention, Mitt Romney did not have on his pub of schedule a public event on two consecutive days in the United States. A period of four months where the president was being president, occasionally the president makes news, also was being candidate, flying for multiple events a day in swing states that everybody knew in advance were going to be swing states. Goes to Iowa, goes to Wisconsin, he goes to Florida, he goes to North Carolina and Virginia. Mitt Romney is fundraising in Boca Raton. Mitt Romney makes an event, one event, no questions, back to fundraising. He did have public events, back-to-back -back days, sometime in July. We remember how well the foreign trip in London insulting his hosts went the speeches in Poland, the speeches in Israel, back to the United States and back to the real business at hand, raising money. They thought that that would work. They thought that that would work because of a simple opinion. They could not entertain the possibility that having seen what the president's agenda was, having seen what the president's rhetoric was, having seen the shape of his coalition and the direction he was aiming, they could not conceive of the possibility that Americans would not reject it. In fact, you could see throughout the campaign. When polls suggested they were behind, they disputed the accuracy of the polls. Too many Democrats, they said. We know from past history there aren't that many Democrats in the electorate. Too many this, too many that. Don't believe those polls behind the curtain. Believe in America. That was the campaign slogan. Not that they ever explained what it meant. The Obama campaign kept its eye on the ball, as you know. And I'll explain how they kept their eye on the ball in this talk. And at the end, when the question came down, do you prefer the devil that you know or the devil that you don't? They preferred that the devil that they did by 51 to 47. For the first time in three elections, fewer Americans absolutely voted than in the previous election. And as a percentage of Americans, it remained relatively at a record high. But about five million Americans chose not to vote based on the percentage of Americans who had chosen to vote in both 2004 and 2008. Not only did they win, but five million Americans who otherwise normally would have voted in a high interest year decided that there wasn't a dime's worth of difference between these two candidates. Now this is distressing to conservatives. It's distressing to conservatives precisely because they believe they see the future and the future is not American. They believe they see the direction the president is going in and it's to fundamentally remake the idea of American citizenship into something that is not as unique as the founders had intended, in something that embraces a higher moral status for the collective and a lower moral status for the individual, one that places more value on collective decision making than individual entrepreneurship. They believe in America, but they did not explain to America what that idea was and how somebody who did not automatically see that vision could be part of their America. They could talk to themselves, our country is slipping away. We're becoming like Europe. I won't recognize America when my children are born. You can go to any conservative gathering and hear those exact phrases or near enough analogs that you'll think that I've gotten some doppelganger on a wall. But they lost, and it wasn't close. Now this creates some despair among conservatives. When you expect to be measuring the drapes of the White House and instead you're on the outside looking in, this can cause some consternation. Now adding to this despair is demographic change that everyone has, could have seen coming, 
Most Republicans chose not to see it, but now it is in front of them like a bug on a windshield on the turnpike. The election was decided by the non-white vote for the first time decisively in American history. 72% of the electorate in the 2012 election was white, according to the exit poll. Now, of course, that's self-described. It includes many people of many different ethnic backgrounds and racial backgrounds and religious backgrounds. There's no monolithic white vote any more than there's a monolithic non-white vote. But nevertheless, the racial differences are stark. Romney carried the white vote 59 to 39, a 20-point lead, the fourth highest that a Republican has carried the white vote since the advent of exit polling. No candidate in American history had ever carried the white vote with 59% of the vote and lost the presidency. Then he lost by four points. He lost by four points because he lost the non-white vote by 63 points. He actually improved his standing among African Americans from over uh, John McCain. John McCain got 5% of the vote or 4% of the vote, depending on the exit poll, and Mitt Romney got 6, a 50% improvement. Yay, team. Um, but among Hispanics and Asians, he did even worse. Somehow, Hispanics chose not to self-deport prior to the election, but rather to self-report to the voting booth. And this segment of the electorate is growing. In fact, every election since the 1996 election, like clockwork, the share of the non-white vote has gone up as a share of the total voters by 2%, and the share of the white vote has gone down by 2%. Now, there's a lot of caveats to that. Some of that is because in 2008, African Americans voted in record high numbers, and they voted again in 2012 in record high numbers. Will they do so when Obama's not on the ballot? I don't know. But nevertheless, each year, because of who's coming into the country and being born, and who's leaving the country because of death, fewer whites there may be more whites, absolutely, but as a share of the eligible electorate, the share of whites in the eligible electorate is shrinking and the share of non-whites is growing. In fact, in 2016, if there is a not a dramatic shrinkage in the African-American vote, a Republican candidate will need to get 60% of the white vote, plus a record high among African-Americans, plus a record high among Asians, plus a record high among Hispanics, plus a record high on those people who don't classify themselves in any of those categories or are American Indian or Hawaiian or, or, or a loot um, to win a bare 50.1% of the vote. So you can imagine, I work in Washington, D.C., and everyone is in Washington, D.C. rather gleeful because the establishment is not conservative. Shocked me. The establishment would like to see conservatism fall. The establishment believes that this is something that portends doom. So how does the first question I pose, how does the first set of issues I pose about American identity intersperse with the last questions, which is sheer numbers, the demographic weight? They interact because of the nature of cons modern conservatism and the concerns of the electorate. In its parodied form, and sometimes if you ask some Tea Party or libertarian activist in its non-parodied form, you would believe that the conservative movement is about what I call hands-off government. Got a problem with your kid? Not my problem. Got a problem with your retirement? Not my problem. Should have thought of that. Depend on your family. Depend on your church. Depend on your own voluntary structures. You're going to be free, sturdy, and strong. Hands-off government. Or what was the phrase Obama used? Uh, you're on your own government or you're on your own society, he had a very nice catchy phrase that basically said the same thing. So if American principles, which conservatives ardently support, founding principles, if founding principles require hands-off government, then it looks pretty bleak because people generally rejected that. In fact, they've rejected that since, oh, let's try the election of 1912 when two progressives and a socialist got 75% of the vote against constitutionalist William Harold Taft. Oh, maybe 1860, when the party of Lincoln was the party of government action through tariffs, subsidization of railroads, creation of colleges to uh, extend learning, and subsidization of settlement of the West through the Homestead Act over the laissez-faire policies of the Southern and the Northern Democrats. If American principles require hands-off government, American principles have been not part of our politics for a very long time. But I don't think that's what American politics and principles require. I think that's a parody of what conservatism believes. 
I think the harder question is, can 1980s era conservatism win in the future? Effectively, Mitt Romney ran by paying lip service to the Reagan platform of lower taxes, higher defense spending, traditional values not spoken about too loudly, and dealing with social spending by nibbling around the edges and not touching core entitlements, at least for people who are anywhere near voting age. Nationally, in sections, that coalition still wins. But nationally, it does not. It does not win uh, in part because it was successful in the 80s, 90s, and aughts, only because of what I call benign neglect. That conservatives could ignore what we would now call the entitlement state or the welfare state or what I call the entitlement welfare state because economic growth allowed us to neither shrink dramatically nor expand dramatically these programs and allow us to cut taxes and run small but prudent deficits so that essentially the Goldwater challenge that was faced, uh, posed in 1964 to repeal the New Deal to repeal the advances and the decisions of 1932, the one that Ronald Reagan supported but which the American people rejected, uh, the 1980s era conservatism avoided that question through economic growth. That's no longer a tenable option. It's no longer a tenable option because as we've got changes in our economy, more low-skilled immigration, more people who are being, uh, we see a bimodal distribution and income distribution, more families are moving up, some families are moving down, the middle class is hollowing out. On average, people are better off, but there are more people who are in the lower middle class, more people who are in the working class. That creates some demand for public service. And with our fiscal crisis, there's simply no way to continue to borrow at a prudent amount without touching some aspect of the entitlement welfare state or dramatically increase taxes. The conservative coalition has to choose what it has chosen not to choose to do for 32 years, and it's having a difficult time doing it. The problem that conservatives face in that environment is that if forced to choose between taxing someone else to preserve their benefits and cutting their benefits, if those are the only choices that they have, and that effectively is the choice that was presented to them in 2012, they will choose to tax somebody else. That's why we have higher taxes on what the so-called wealthy are and why we don't have significant spending cuts right now. So conservative, common wisdom says that conservatism can't deal with these changes and that consequently we're about ready to go into a 30 to 40 year, dec 30 to 40 year liberal period akin to the New Deal period which remade American society in an infinitely more uh, centralized and government uh, focused way. I think the co common wisdom does not have to be right. In fact, I think conservatives have it within their own power to choose whether the common wisdom will become the truth or whether or not we are actually going to go through a modern age of conservatism. Now conservatives have been here before, 1976. Those of us old enough to remember it, uh, which of course in, was in the days when there were no exit polls and you actually saw uh, real numbers on your screen with computers and clicking uh, and you had to wait till four in the morning to even have an idea who might win. After 1976, conservatism was laughably dead. Ronald Reagan had lost his challenge to Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford had lost the presidency. Only one third of the House was Republican. About half of them, by any measure, was called, were moderates or liberals. Conservatism was considered as relevant to modern life as ancient Egypt was. In fact, the Minnesota Republican Party changed its name to the Independent Republican Party because you would never want to be simply known as a Republican. Ronald Reagan walked into the Conservative Political Action Committee in 1977 and said, the common wisdom is wrong. We're going to get power back. We're going to get it without changing our principles. And in his speech, which is available on the internet, the New Republican Party, he basically gave the other side his battle plan. He talked about how he, to talk to Americans. He talked about principles of freedom. He talked about how people who were economically successful and people who weren't could combine together over a core set of values and an appreciation for each other's issues priorities. In other words, asking the Reagan Democrats to join the country club party and create a new Republican party. And we've been living in the age that Ronald Reagan created in that speech and through his actions ever since. What was 
the missing ingredient. What did Ronald Reagan add that conservatives before him, and I would submit conservatives after him, did not quite understand? I would say it's two things. One, both actually you can find in Ronald Reagan's speech endorsing Barry Goldwater in 1964. His television speech that launched him on his way to fame and to the presidency, he introduced two elements that had been sorely lacking. The first was a serious respect for the real aspirations of the common person. Not as an abstract entity of somebody who was some idea, person who was uh, desiring to be completely independent in some sort of stereotypical Western frontiersman way, but as he called it, a simple soul. The person who goes to work, gets, you know, uh, gets lunch, bucks for a raise, pays his mortgage, contributes to his church, raises his kids, and knows there's no such thing as a free lunch. That's roughly a paraphrase of what he wrote in December of 1964 in the National Review. That person had moral aspirations to a simple life that Ronald Reagan thought was valuable. They were not people who wanted a handout. That's what the phrase, they have no, they know there ain't no such thing as a free lunch means. But they weren't hardy Western hands-off pioneers either. They drove to work on government roads, they educated their kids in government schools, they relied in some degree on government's retirement programs to make sure they weren't penurious in old age. They were not libertarians. They were Americans, a complex hybrid of people who understood how to govern their own lives, but also could govern everyone's life through a, through a sense of mutual aid and citizenship. And the second element he added was the implementation of that, and that's government. In Ronald Reagan's speech, he goes through a typical litany that one could have heard at any speech in less eloquent terms of that time, blasting government this and blasting government that, and I don't have any problem with all of that. Uh, he was very trenchant in his observations, and he spoke eloquently for the need of, for freedom both here and at home. But at one point towards the end of his speech, he says, they always tell us what we're against, but they ask us what we're for. I'm going to tell you what we're for. And he said two things that ought to be remembered today. And he talked about Social Security and what today we would call Medicare. They didn't have Medicare in 1964. That was one of the things that was being proposed by Johnson in 1964. And what he said was, we accept, with respect to Social Security, that people should not suffer poverty as a result of unemployment through old age. So to that extent, we uh, accept Social Security uh, as a means towards that end. In other words, he wasn't going to go back before the New Deal. He was not the stereotypical Goldwater, right, who wanted to repeal Social Security and simply say, if, you're, if you don't have family and you're 66 and you can't work and you don't have a church that can take care of you, you're on your own. That wasn't Ronald Reagan. He then went on and talked about different ways to think about retirement so that people weren't in a one-size-fits-all government program and they could provide for themselves, but that people who really needed it wouldn't be thrown out on the street. And then he applied the same principle to what we now call Medicare. He said that he opposed a centralized, one-size-fits-all government-run program. That's essentially what Medicare is. Regardless of your circumstances, you get the same benefits, and with only a couple of exceptions, you pay the same price. He said that he proposed and favored a smaller program that uh, addressed people who really needed support, who didn't have the money to access government, uh, to access health care on their own, but that there was no need to submit, submit everybody to the same government-run program. Again, a new government program. Nobody said, Ronald Reagan, you're against the Constitution. Nobody stood up and said, hey, wait a minute, that's unfair. And the reason why I think conservatives of that day, and I would submit conservatives this day respond to that, is what Reagan did was essentially make a moral rather than a procedural argument. He didn't speak about government power, he spoke about justice. He spoke about how to help average people with things that they could be helped to save for themselves, they could be provided for if they really could not save for themselves, they would not be left on their own, but they would be helped. They would be given a hand up in American society. Now, I wish Reagan's heirs had followed that. 
But unfortunately, I think what's happened in modern conservatism is, is two things simultaneously. One is that some of the tensions within conservatism since its founding remain unreconciled. And they remain not unreconciled because the way that Reagan reconciled was not fully appreciated by his heirs. So let me first walk through what the issue with uh, some of the conservative tendencies are. Uh, conservatism classically has been described as a fusionism, which is to say it combined, for people who are historians of the conservative movement, they say there are different elements of conservatives who retained their identity but united as in a fusion in opposition to certain uh, shared enemies, uh, the Soviet Union abroad and the rapid ideological expansion of the state at home. Now, there were many differences among those conservatives. There were traditionalists who generally liked small towns and didn't have a problem with government on the local level, but didn't like the massive expansion of the federal government in the New Deal. There were anti-communists like Whitaker Chambers, who basically were former leftists who thought that there wasn't really a problem with the New Deal, but the problem is that uh, we shouldn't be trying to remake society at a rapid pace and we shouldn't give in to the Soviet Union. They would be at a, opposed on domestic policy to the traditionalists. And then there were libertarians who had differences with both of them, people who followed Friedrich Hayek and later Ayn Rand, who would oppose traditionalists on question of government power at home and would oppose anti-communists on questions of government power abroad except when the Soviet Union was involved. Even Miss Rand, as an emigre from the Soviet Union, didn't have a problem with anti-communism. What Reagan's heirs have tended to do is not see the synthesis that he proposed. What they've tended to do is treat Reagan's formulation as a set of acts rather than a set of principles or a way of thinking. They've tended to treat the, the, uh, the, the teachings of Reagan as a few things. One, run against the liberals. People don't like the state. So you've seen, as you can see, campaigns for 30 years running against liberals, running against liberals, running against liberals. And then people on, of a fiscally conservative bent wonder, well, why is it that if we run against liberals, we get bigger government when we elect the people who are running against the liberals? It's because the conservatives have never agreed on themselves what's in and what's out. They've never agreed among themselves what is the appropriate and proper use of government for They've repeated the platform points that worked in 1980 as if they were a mantra, sometimes sincerely and sometimes not. Everyone who's nominated is pro-life. Everybody who's nominated wants a stronger military. Everybody who's nominated wants tax cuts. And everybody who's nominated promises not to touch any welfare program or any government benefit program that any distinct group of voters remotely cares about. Look at how in, one, in the uh, uh, first debate, uh, Barack Obama tried to pin Romney down and say, you would cut education spending. And he said, no, I'm not going to cut education spending. Okay? He took $86 billion, one half percent of GDP, off the table with one sentence. Because who wants to defend what's in? If you haven't thought about what government's role in education is, why would you want to get trapped in uh, the problems of trying to explain what's it, what you're going to cut and what you're not going to cut? Problem is, when you do that, you have nothing left to cut and you get growing government. So the result has been an anti-liberal consensus, not a pro-conservative one. And as a result of both that and another important change, a growing estrangement from non-Southern, non-evangelicals. If you look in the exit polls, if you are not one of three groups, if you are not from the South, if you are not an evangelical anywhere in the country, and you are not a church-going Catholic, which is to say a white Catholic, which is to say somebody who attends Mass at least once a week, you are highly unlikely to be a Republican. Highly unlikely to be a Republican. About 66 to 70 percent of the people who do not fit into one of those three categories voted for President Obama. And what is that other category that people have tended to move away from? And this, I don't, I don't know how exactly it uh, came into the conservative discourse, but it is forgetting the moral value of the average person and substituting for it the moral superiority of the great. How many times have we heard about the great entrepreneur, the businessman? He built it. What about the worker? Do you think the worker in that building, in that job, automatically identifies with the manager? Automatically identifies, yeah, whatever is, whatever is good for General Motors is good for me. I'm happy to have that role. 
not the way people perceive themselves. Think about the Normandy speech. Now, Ronald Reagan, in 1984, celebrated the 40th anniversary of the storming of the beaches of Normandy with what was then a famous speech. And he was most noted for his praise of the average people who stormed cliffs on the Normandy beach under withering German fire. People who were farmers from Kansas and bricklayers from Charleston and teachers from Brooklyn who went up under orders and took the cliffs and saved Europe. He called them the boys of Pointe de Foc. Can one imagine Mitt Romney praising the valor of the boys of Pointe du Hoc rather than praising the sagacity of Eisenhower, the bravery of Patton, the genius of the armaments makers who gave them the tools to take the beach? Perhaps. I have a hard time. The sense that the average person has a moral life that is worth leading and pursuing and sometimes needs a little help to get them on the way and keep them from falling is something that is remotely connected to much, but not all, of conservative thought today, but which is central to American political identity. The Obama campaign ran against this relentlessly. Think about the contraceptive question. The, religious man the question of mandating religious employers to mandate contraceptive coverage was a classic wedge issue that was designed to raise precisely that point among single women and other people who are concerned that their, at, their ability to uh, succeed in modern America was imperiled if they could not control their own bodies. And they forced Republicans to defend uh, people who, however noble and right, are perceived by that group as being potential elements of their profession, uh, of, 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 uh, their, uh, of their dreams. Uh, uh, the, there are many people who will look and say, if you're with the priests, you're not with me. If you're with, the, if you're with the religious entities, you're not with me. It was very calculated. They were running and saying, you know you need to control your body. They not only are opposed to abortion, they don't even get contraception. They're not running for you. Hispanics, that's what immigration was all about. You want to have part of the American dream, you, they won't even consider the DREAM Act. You, as a young Hispanic boy, brought to America against your will. You want to give what Lincoln called the last measure of your devotion on a far distant battlefield, they won't give you the first item of their consideration. They're not running for you. Blue collar workers of whatever race or gender, but particularly men in the industrial Northwest, people who are being hammered by unemployment, people who more than any other group either suffered unemployment or knew somebody who suffered unemployment, people who came out and voted en masse against Obama in 2010, they said, look at the other guy. Do you trust management? Their economic policy is that you've over the last 20 years seen your lives squeezed, even if you're making it, and a lot of you aren't, and their lives get better, and their economic policy is to give more money to their friends and hope that they do right by you. They're not running for you. So is it any surprise that with that campaign we see Record high margins among single women for Obama, record high margins among Hispanics for Obama, and record low turnout in areas where, where, where non-evangelical, non-Southern, blue-collar men predominate in the electorate. We can see this in one question from the exit poll. You ask at the end of the exit poll, which one of these characteristics do you want to see in a president? 79% of Americans chose one of the first three. They voted for Mitt Romney. And they did not vote for him by narrow margins. In each of those categories, shares my values as a strong leader, um, uh, ha uh, has a plan for America. He won by 9 to 23 points. So usually when you carry 80% of the vote by about 14 points, you're measuring your drapes for the Oval Office. He lost because 21% chose the fourth group, and Romney lost them by over 60 points. And that group was cares about people like me. Republicans don't have a racial gap. They don't have a gender gap. They don't have a marriage gap. All of those are symptoms of the real gap. They've got an empathy gap. So what needs to be done? What needs to be done is Republicans need to come home. Conservatives need to come home. They need to come home to the Reagan vision of America, which is one that sees government as a threat but not an enemy, 
an adversary but not a foe, to one that's in, in line with the heritage of its party, of the Lincolns, that founded the land-grant colleges, that founded tariffs to help the working man gain wage, the one that permitted people to go settle in the West without having any, paying anything for their land and paying for their protection through the army and clearing the land with Indians and subsidizing transportation through the railroads so that they could get their goods back to market and make their way in life. A hand up, not a hand on, not industrial policy that said we're going to choose widgets over tables, that you, we're going to choose corn over wheat, but a hand up that said you need some help so that you can live your dreams and that you can live a free and independent life. And that needs to occur not just in the economic sphere, but in the social sphere. The Republican Party was the party of emancipation. Why can't the Republican Party be the party that reduces social discrimination in America so that all people don't rely on unelected bureaucrats to determine whether they are in or out, but craft a fair policy that works to allow everyone to pursue their dreams? Fifty years ago, sixty years ago, there were two young Arizonans who went to Stanford Law School. One finished number one, one finished number three. William Rehnquist finished number one. He went back to Arizona and got a job. Sandra Day finished number three and couldn't get a job as a lawyer because who would hire a woman? She's just going to have babies anyway. One should never doubt why Sandra Day O'Connor ended up voting for sex discrimination statutes or voted to uphold expansive definitions of sex discrimination when those questions came before the court? Should Republicans be on the wrong side of that question? Now, what would that look like today? Ironically, I think it means actually smaller government. Because what's happened today is we have extended so many handouts to the rich and to the poor and to people who don't deserve it. We've extended so much protection to people who don't deserve it through crony capitalism that simply restoring a all honest American approach of hand up government, let's make it small. Let's take a look at two examples. New York City. Some of you may remember that New York City used to be a den of crime. 2,200 murders a year, tons of property violence and or disorder in the street. If any of you ever saw the movie Crocodile Dundee or Arthur from the 80s, the whole joke of that movie, the whole raison d'etre of those movies, were very popular in the 80s, was the disorderly nature of New York, the greatest, richest city in the world, just beset in public squalor. Now, a libertarian could say, well, look, no wonder. You've got the government in charge of the police department. They can't ever do anything right. Mayor Rudy Giuliani said, no, that's not the problem. The problem is we're not running the police department for the interests of citizens. We're in running the, the police department for the interests of the police department. And he focused their attention through management on crime fighting and reduction of crime rather than making arrests. And today, there are 7,500 fewer policemen in New York City than there were when he started. You got a reduction in murders from 2,200 to under 600 last year, and 7,500 fewer, 6,500 fewer people on the force. Better government and smaller government. Same thing happened with welfare reform. That rather than trying to eliminate federal guarantees for welfare, Republicans and Democrats got together in 1996 and said what we need to do is change the incentives. P most of these people can work. Those who won't will support, but those who, or those who can't will support, but those who can, we'll give them support, we'll give them transportation vouchers, we'll give them childcare, we'll give them job counseling, and we'll give them a kick out the door if they need it. There'll be help if they need it permanently, there'll be help if they need it temporarily, but they'll be expected to move on to the workforce. And what we see now is a government on welfare budget, that, on that sense of welfare, that's much, much smaller than it would have been given the growth of population. Caseloads that are only a third of what they were 15 years ago. More single mothers in the workforce than existed beforehand. And in the last couple of recessions, people didn't go back on the caseloads. They went on unemployment insurance. Why? Because for the first time in their lives, they had worked in a private sector job long enough to qualify for that rather than welfare. Better government smaller government. So I've thrown a lot at you. I hope that some of it will cause some food for thought. But I think that what we are at is a period that happens only about every 30 years, 30 to 40 years in American politics, which is a decisive period where Americans debate first principles. 
they decide which party is best suited and which party's heart and head are in the right place to help the average person get along with the realities that they face in the America of today. In the new century, who's going to offer them a new deal to enact long-standing and eternal principle? So I would argue that the conservatives can understand that they're the party of government of, by, and for the people, as opposed to the party that wants to repeal all government entirely. If they're the party of the hand up, rather than the party of the hand out, or the hand on, or the hand off, that they will continue on what Ronald, us, on what Ronald Reagan called mankind's 6,000 year journey from the swamp to the stars. Tomatoes. Where does immigration policy fall within the spectrum of things that you're looking at, and how? What are the possibilities, and how would they impact this situation? Um, there is no public support for anything that approaches deportation. And uh, in fact, if you, there was a question in the exit poll for that that showed uh, that um, well, even among Mitt Romney supporters, uh, only about less than a majority supported deportation as opposed to a path for citizenship. Now, those are binary sorts. You know, there's a lot in between those. But the fact is, absent some form of deportation, there is no serious way to uh, change, deal with the status of the people who are already living in this country. So I think what the Gang of Eight is doing right now, which is finding a way to balance border security in a real way, balance a path to citizenship for people who want it. Many people who are living here don't, that like to be guest workers or semi-permanent residents. Um, and doing it in a way that tries to balance the interests involved is the best way forward both for the country and for conservatives. It is futile to try and uh, tell 20% of the people who are living in this country that you would rather have them go home. Yes, Senator. Uh, do you want to call the questions? That's fine. No, actually, Henry, why don't you go ahead and I'll sit down and let you. Right. Senator, it's good uh, to see you again. Very provocative talk, and thank you very much. Um, one thing that I didn't hear you discuss, although I think probably like a number of people in this room, I've done a lot of thinking since November. Mm -hmm about the very issues that you're talking about, mm -hmm. is the whole question of the makers versus the takers, and whether or not we reach the tipping point, we hear that phrase a lot, yeah. uh, of whether the people who have more to gain from government than those who are producing mm -hmm. uh, revenues and, and production mm -hmm. in general. And that when the number of people who benefit from the government reaches a certain point, mm -hmm. then it's kind of an intellectual process right. that, they, that they will just reinforce themselves and uh, head us down a path of Greece. Yeah. I think, you know, um, there's a couple of things about makers versus takers. One, um, who's a maker and who's a taker? You know, the Romney comments that gave rise to that implied that the sole criteria was do you pay anything in federal income taxes? And that's what the 5347 was about, that 53 percent of American uh, American uh, adults pay something in federal income tax and 47 percent pay nothing in federal income tax. Now a lot of the 47 percent pay payroll taxes. All of them pretty much or most of them pay state taxes either directly through income taxes and sales taxes or excise taxes. But leave that as it may. That I think is an inadequate division point. I think that was part of the source of the comments uh, resonance which is that Think about who doesn't pay income taxes. Uh, a 30-year-old single mother uh, who makes $25,000 a year doesn't pay income taxes because of the earned income tax credit. You want to take that away so that she's a maker rather than a taker? If she's working full-time, is she a taker or a maker? If somebody's making 50 grand a year and they've got no income tax liability because of President Bush and Newt Gingrich's child tax credit, we, the Republicans created that, put it in at $500 a child in 1997, doubled as part of President Bush's tax plan to $1,000 a child. If that's, 
if that's the person who's not paying income tax, they're working full time, they're raising two kids, they've never gotten in trouble with the law, but they get $2,000 a year in tax credits because of Republican initiatives. Are they makers or are they takers? So I think if we're going to talk about that, it needs to be talked about in a really sophisticated way. Um, the second question is a moral one, and it comes with um, if people temporarily are takers, and anybody who's on unemployment insurance is temporarily a taker, does that mean they're permanently a taker? Do we oppose that? Do we want to go back to before 1933 when there was a patchwork of unemployment insurance laws in the country rather than a national policy? To throw, a, so in an intellectual way, one could say, yeah, you don't want to be a state where everyone, you know, the problem with Greece is everyone's got a government job. And the government jobs are, bar are financed by money borrowed from overseas. So when the money goes away, you lose your job. That's not the problem we've got in America. The problem is much more subtle, much more discreet, and uh, needs to be talked about much more in that way. I think most Americans who receive unemployment insurance would say, yeah, I might be a taker now, but I'll be a maker tomorrow. The person who receives uh, a Pell Grant to go through school might be a taker now, they might be an engineer tomorrow. Um, and then everyone can say, yeah, and then there's the person who's been on benefits for 25 years and has never done a day's work in their life. And you s it, We have to be very careful because I think most Americans who receive benefits are makers. They're just not as ambitious or they're down on their luck. And to say, if we want to say as Republicans and conservatives that we favor a hands-off society, then we ought to say it and make the moral case for it. But I don't think that's what most people believe. I think most people distinguish between the permanent dependent and the person who's temporarily dependent. Temporary assistance for needy families is what welfare reform calls the new program. Uh, and I think in thinking about that, we need to be very careful and try and distinguish between people who are getting the help that they need for the time that they need it and people who are gaming the system and are, use, are, are being create, encouraged to game the system by a bad system that encourages dependency. Yeah. No, you know, um, I think people are open to reform of entitlement programs, but what they want to know is that there's a place for them in the lifeboat. If they, you know, we have a phrase, Nixon goes to China. You know, why is it that President Richard Nixon could go and create diplomatic relations with red China, communist China, when they were, for 30, 22 years, America had pretended that they didn't exist because they had overthrown an American-friendly government? It's because for all of his life, he had credibility as being an anti-communist. Yeah, it was an unorthodox thing to do, but because you knew what was in his heart, you could trust his judgment. If Republicans want to reform entitlement policy, they need to establish some form of the high ground on the question of do you have somebody's interest at heart so they can trust that the reforms that you're going to propose and make are actually in sync with their values, not in sync with somebody else's values. And that's one of the things that Democrats do time and time again is uh, say, for example, on Paul Ryan's Medicare budget, uh, Medicare plan, uh, that they say, look, over time the value of the voucher will shrink because you cap the value of the voucher. So that means, yeah, it may not hit anybody who's 65 now, but if you're 50 and you buy into Paul Ryan's plan, you don't know that you will be able to afford the same degree of medical care and access to doctors that your grandma has. And to say blithely, as some Republicans do, not Paul, but other Republicans do, the market will take care of it, somehow is not so reassuring to a 50-year-old person who would kind of like to be able to go to a doctor when they're 75 and they need it. Uh, that's the sort of thing that I think needs to be done, which is taking seriously 
uh, what's in and what's out as far as government. If we're going to have a government financed uh, medical insurance policy, which is what Paul Ryan's plan does, it doesn't go back to pre-1964 America, we should think seriously about what it looks like so that we reassure people who want to have that assurance that it's going to be there you know, uh, when they need it. And that it's not simply a case that we're just trying to cut money. Because if we do, what's going to happen is people will think that we care more about somebody else's money than about their lives, and they won't accept the reform. Well, first of all, for thanks for your lecture. There were a lot of points you made that I think were very poignant uh, and really going to think about. And one of the ones that really stuck out to me um, was the comment you made, I think, earlier on in the lecture uh, about Washington establishment um, being we pulled off the fall from services. And I was wanting to expand on that. I'm sorry, I have a bit of a hearing problem. Washington yeah. establishment. Washington establishment um, being in favor of the fall of conservatism. Oh, yeah. And what it is about conservatism that turns off the establishment and what conservatives can do to counter that. Well, um, you know, there's a lot of things going on in the Washington establishment. Um, some of it is just tribal in the sense that they came in at a time, a lot of them came in at a time where Democrats were pretty dominant and that's who their friends are. And, you never want to see your friends thrown out of office. Uh, some of it is that people who tend to be attracted to those positions that would be permanently powerful in Washington tend to be the sort of people who think that the status quo is morally preferable to the alternative. Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons why most people in the Washington establishment uh, are particularly happy, not just to see Republicans, but particularly to see conservatives lose. Um, what can conservatives do about it? Well, I think if conservatives uh, talked about things the way that I'm suggesting that they talk about, you could alleviate some of that. It certainly would never alleviate all of that. I mean, a committed progressive is going to be a committed progressive no matter what. Somebody who hates religion is going to be somebody who's not going to like fans of religion no matter what. But you know, I think if you had a republicanism and a conservatism that took the art of government seriously, uh, which is what they do in practice but tend not to do in rhetoric, uh, I think you'd see some of that alleviated. And some of it is simply a matter of power. If Republicans are on Washington for 30 years, there won't be a Republican, there won't be a Democratic establishment anymore because they won't get any contracts. Yeah, I mean, what I would say is that conservatives like to use the word conservative, and uh, somebody on the left will never use the term liberal. The term of choice for people who are strongly on the left is progressive, and you'll hear them say that and refer to themselves as that. The term liberal was sufficiently discredited in the 80s that that was, I think the last person who actually said that approvingly was Michael Dukakis in the last week of his doomed campaign, where he finally said, I am a liberal, like FDR, like Truman. Um, look. No label is going to perfectly capture everybody. People will s associate and call themselves with a particular label based more on a general affinity than a specific affinity. We have something called a conservative movement. It is self-aware, self-defined, and self-motivated and has been for 58 years. It's actually rather remarkable in American political history that I believe it's the only non-party political movement that has retained its own name and identity for such an extended period of time. Progressives came in and out of fashion, New Dealers came in and out of fashion, uh, you know, Square Dealers came in and out of fashion. Conservatism has existed as a self-defined entity for 58 years. And I think people on the right argue about what that means, and there are some on the right, the libertarians, who would like to supplant that with a new phrase, but I don't think that it's an entirely meaningless phrase. And to apply it to a non-American uh, context the way people often do is simply to uh, take a different aspect of the word and apply it differently. I mean, Otto von Bismarck was a conservative in one sense, but he's not a conservative in the sense that American conservatism is conservative. And in fact, we could go on 
uh, at a great length as to why American conservatism is actually unique and distinct among all other conservatisms in the world, including those in the Anglosphere. And I would argue it's precisely because of the distinctness of our founding and the role of the average person in the entity and the ideology of the founding. Yeah. To the exclusion of others. I don't I think that the Republican Party um, uh, ha and I think there are elements of the Republican Party that confuse business virtue with human virtue. I think there are elements of the Republican Party that um, exemplify the great achievement but ignore the, uh, the average achievement. You know, Ronald Reagan, when he talked about the average person, actually often did so in the circumstances of them achieving great things. Didn't mean that they were habitually great people. But for Reagan, the ordinary person could do something great because greatness was within anyone. The first person who he, now it's just a shtick, but when Ronald Reagan started the person in the, pod in the stands at the State of the Union address, he was praising a particular person who had jumped off of a bridge into frozen water to save passengers on a downed airline flight in the Potomac. His name was Lenny Skutnik. He was a man who was obscure before that moment, and he's a man who is obscure to all of you because you've probably never heard that name before unless you lived through it. But what he was trying to say was, here's an ordinary man who did an extraordinary thing. And now he's going to go back and be an ordinary man. But we should recognize that we're all capable of extraordinary things. So I think conservatism that understands that in the way that Ronald Reagan innately understood it without intellectual argumentation is a conservatism that will resonate. But a conservatism that says, you built that when 89% of Americans do not build anything other than their own lives implicitly says what you're doing is of less value or not worthy of discussion. And for some reason, they might not vote for you. Well, you know, um, two things about that. One, um, or three things about that. One, the centralized media was much more powerful 30 years ago than it was, is today. When uh, there was a saying that uh, Lyndon Johnson he used to have three, back then there were three television networks. I know it's shocking, but there were only three television networks. And one had a dominant share of the daily news, you know, CBS. And Lyndon Johnson, the consummate Paul, had three television in his office so he could simultaneously watch all of the news. And in the Vietnam War, there was a time when the anchor of the most popular program, Walter Cronkite, decided that the American government was lying and said on the air that he didn't think that the Americans were going to win the Vietnam War. And Johnson said, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost the country. It is really impossible for me to imagine an American president saying, oh my god, Katie Couric doesn't lost me, I'm toast. <laughs> Secondly, we've always fought this as conservatives. There's never been a time since the 1950s when the dominant electronic media or the dominant intellectual elite has not been predisposed to the left. Yet, people manage to win elections. And in part that's because we don't live in a totalitarian dictatorship. They do have to let people speak. They can slant it, they can color it, but there are always times, whether it's through advertising or through coverage, that you actually hear the candidate or actually get a sense for what the candidate says. And that means that it's never a complete blanket. And the third thing I'd say is 
In the day before electronic news programs, newspapers were everything, and newspapers hated Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Boy, did they hate FDR. It didn't stop him. If you have a message, you have a policy, and you have courage, you can win. Rudy Giuliani proved that in New York. The New York Times tried to kill him for eight years, but he didn't care what they thought. He just did what was right for the people. He communicated it with courage and aplomb, and he had policies that worked, and he got reelected, and he saved New York City. Yes. So what is to be done from your perspective? That is to say, who's going to come in on the white horse to lead the conservative movement to the Yeah, I always get the question, who? Um, here's what... And if Brian wants to be the guy here... But yeah, here's, here's what I'll say. Um, American politics is amazingly fluid. In 1962, there were polls taken, and you, know, you take a look and say, who's going to be the next Republican nominee against John F. Kennedy? Is it going to be Bill Scranton or Nelson Rockefeller? You know, nobody thought that Goldwater guy was going to win. You know, who heard of Ronald Reagan in 1963? Who heard of Barack Obama in 2002 when the only thing he had on his resume on from a national office was losing to a former Black Panther in a Democratic primary for a House seat in the south side of Chicago? American politics is unbelievably open and fluid. So who's going to be that person? Is there going to be that person? If I could know that, I mean, it's one thing to predict an election the day beforehand with a lot of data in front of If I could know that, I'd really be rich. But the, what, what I will say is the more people talk, if I'm right, that the Republican Party and the conservative movement has not changed so much that they are, uh, are not using that they would not be open to this sort of language. You know, I can usually pretty much tell the difference between a conservative or a libertarian uh, when I question them because a conservative ultimately will talk in a way that says, yeah, at some point I agree that government ought to do this for somebody and a libertarian will just throw up their hands and say, well, you know, bad things happen in life. Um, I don't think most people are libertarians. I think when push comes to shove, most conservatives are hand up conservative. And once they hear the message, I think the Potemkin village of, of uh, the hard anti-government message will just shrink away. Uh, quick follow-up? Yeah, because there's other people. I don't want to cut. So, but basically, you think it's, it's, it's someone at the presidential level? It's always at the presidential level in this country. You start somewhere else, and you gain a national following. But ultimately, in a system without strong centralized parties, Ultimately, what happens is uh, a presidential primary is kind of like multiple businesses seeking to, uh, in a winner-take-all fashion, own a marketplace. And the person with the best product and the best price wins. Well, as someone who considers myself to be somewhat of a non-doctrinaire libertarian, I guess I'd ask, is there room for some sort of, um, of a fusion in the middle? Because I do agree that libertarians often are too absolute in saying, you know, absolutely out of this, but to say sort of somewhere in the middle with perhaps, uh, you know, understanding that there are certain parts of the political structure which are here in terms of um, Social Security and Medicare, but, you know, looking to reform that, but also adopting uh, more of a libertarian social view, or do you see the sort of, the, that as sort of distinctly part of the um, conservative movement? Yeah, again? I think there are many shades of libertarianism. Um, uh, there's the hard libertarianism that, uh, as I was saying to one person walking over, you know, take a look out at uh, Route 30. A hard libertarian will talk about government tyranny and a soft libertarian, you know, because it's a public road. We all know the public can't do anything right. Um, I went into Washington and people argue with me about that all the time, you know. Once we'll eventually get through and Route 30 will be a private road. And then there's more people like you who have a love of liberty and a love of individual self-determination, but don't carry things through to an ideological uh, um, uh, extreme. And I think within that, uh, that's actually the heart of conservatism, uh, American conservatism. And on libertarian social policy, you know, um, I think the American people are generally traditionalists by choice, which is to say most Americans would like to live some, a life that is not recognizably different from the lives that they've read about their, their parents and their grandparents live, but they would rather not be compelled to do so by law, incentive, or social pressure. And is that a conservative policy? Is that a liberal policy? Is that libertarian? Is that progressive? I think the first 
I think the first political party that gets there wins those issues because I think that's where Americans are. Uh, yes. of um, like a pope who might slightly depart from predecessors, do you think that could affect the voting patterns of people who attend religious services more often? Yeah, that would be an interesting question. Um, first, that will only affect Catholics, largely. I mean, there's a minor overbleed between what papal actions, uh, what the pope does, and what other religion, people who are religious do. Um, you know, the, the church has, in the modern eye, been increasingly been identified with stands on the family and sexual mores as opposed to other aspects of its ministry. If this, father, if this pope is signaling that he wants to either move in a more balanced direction without changing the doctrine on those matters, could that have a different stance? That's speculative. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I do know from what I see in the data that Catholics who do not practice are uniquely motivated to vote against people that they perceive as Catholics who are ultra-traditional. The group that was most anti-Rick Santorum in the Republican primary was non-practicing Catholics. Yes. I'm sorry, I do have a hearing problem, so I have to ask you to... So after the election, particularly a lot of the people I work with, um, there was this idea that what we need to do is we need to dig in our heels, um, we, need some, we need somebody who's more Mitt Romney, um, mm -hmm. who's more staunch. How, how do you think Republicans and conservatives in general should resist that, that effort? Well, I call that the louder and clearer bunch. Okay. That if only, you know, it's kind of like the person who goes into a foreign country and you know, an Italian person doesn't speak English and you say maybe you can get them to understand if only you speak louder and clearer? Um, look, there is no majority. Yeah, I, I know the political consultant for the Club for Growth. Uh, great friend of mine, great guy, extremely smart. Um, was personally involved in most of the senatorial challenges that you've read about. I asked him over beers, do you think there's a constituency in this country for cutting domestic spending by 30%? He almost spit his beer out in laughter. But yeah, the Club for Growth platform implies that there is, okay? Because the sort of budgets that the Republican Study Committee and, uh, and the Heritage Foundation put out imply that we can cap federal spending at around 18 to 19 percent of GDP without cutting defense spending, without seriously cutting Social Security, which means cutting uh, the rest by about 30 percent, okay? There is no majority for the louder and clearer crowd. There is a majority for people who want to offer Americans a hand up that will help them reduce the scope of government in their lives, but make the parts of government that they do depend on legitimately work better and enable more on, in, entrepreneurship in the provision side and choice on the selection side. I mean, imagine, most of you have 30 apps on your iPhones. You can talk to people anywhere in the world at an instant. And when you're 65, you're going to go into a government-run program where you have one choice of plan and one choice of benefits. And at the rate that things are going with respect to how you want to control costs, you're going to have one choice of hospital because that's how you hold choices down. That's how you hold costs down if you don't have innovation. Does that make any sense to anybody? That you've got more choice on your phone than you've got in your government-provided medical plan? Why can't we talk about that? Yeah. Hey, I want to ask a broad question. Sure. So you said um, this is less, the question we should be asking is less procedural, not are we for against taxes, uh, what are we going to do about education spending and so on, but what is the proper role of government? And I think this question is less a public than a Democrat question than an American. Uh, following that is, what vision ought to inform the Constitution? 
Um, okay. We have a constitution. It is one of enumerated powers. I think if we looked at the way the Constitution was understood originally as opposed to how we understand it today, it was understood to be a document that received its life and vitality from public debate as opposed to judicial pronouncement. That's certainly what Lincoln said with respect to the Dred Scott decision. That's what Madison said with respect to the National Bank. That um, in 1831, I forget who wrote him a letter. As a Mad I, I knew you were going to ask constitutionalism, so I was prepared with my Madison question. So Madison was, she knows this inside and out. So the National Bank of the United States was a proposal to have a national bank, a government owned bank that would take both public and private subscriptions, deposits, and loan them out for projects decided by the bank governors uh, to advance. Um, uh, American uh, economic development. In a sense, it was a what we would now call government-directed enterprise for economic development. Um, and there are people who argued it was unconstitutional. I mean, look at the damn Constitution. There's nothing that says there's power to have a national bank. And there's people who said that it was. And Madison in the 1790s argued it was unconstitutional. And when he was president, he signed the bill that uh, created the second national bank of the United States. So in 1831, someone wrote him a letter and said, what gives? And what he said was, look, this was a question that was fairly debated over multiple years in multiple elections. And the question of the constitutionality was regularly and publicly debated, and the American people spoke. And in speaking, they continually elected people who believed in the constitutionality of the bank. And so consequently, when the bill finally came to him, he felt that he was in the position of a judge in the face of binding precedent. Which is to say, as Madison would say, there's no will independent of society. Just one quick point on that, because it wasn't that um, you interpret the Constitution as public opinion changes or precedents change. Um, it's that the original uh, uh, generation of Americans, those who ratified the Constitution, the original intent, that he had misunderstood. So he's actually not going along with just the Constitution changes as uh, precedent or, or public opinion changes, but that he had actually misunderstood the original. Well, there might be another letter where he said that. The letters that I read actually talked about the presentation of the question before the American people and the regular decision right. that over time the people who shared his initial view uh, receded in strength and people who shared the other views gained in strength. So, are you so that in a sense, constitutionalism is us. So then that gets to the question of what philosophy should be behind the Constitution. I think the philosophy of the founders was one that was neither libertarian nor monarchical. It was one that saw no problem with the establishment of a government monopoly over post roads. It's one that saw no problem with establishing uh, uh, mandatory uh, set-asides of education in the Northwest Ordinance, despite the lack of an explicit constitution. You know, nobody said in 1789, well, gee, you know, we need to put in, can put public education in territories as part of an enumerated power, and thereby ratifying the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. It was just understood that that was the sort of thing that was a proper and just thing that could be done without explicit granting of the power because it was part of the larger power to organize the territories. I think what, you know, Washington favored a national university. They didn't pass one, but it's not like it was unconstitutional. He's not like immediately George Washington thought, well, gee, creating a national, you know, there's no clause that says the government shall foster education through the creation of publicly financed schools. He just thought, it was something that was consistent with the spirit. And I like to, this, you know, I like to speak in non-academic language because I'm not an academic. It's the language that said, this is the country where the average person rules. This is the country where if you come and you're not a lord and you're not a pauper and you're a free person, you have the ability and the freedom to live a free and dignified life. And we have an obligation through popular control to help you lead that. We have an obligation to do that through the collective self-decision of our own government. That's what elections are for. And we create a system that slows it down so that, that enlarges 
the number of people who can be involved in the decision-making process and slows down the decision-making process precisely to make sure that every public question is capable of being put before the public for actual public debate, not notice and comment in a rulemaking thing that special interests go for, but actual public debate. That's what the three-day clause is about. That's what the reading the bills clause is about. It's all designed to say, ultimately, the people. And I think the philosophy behind it was that a people who are sufficiently uh, given the ability to rule are capable, average people, Lenny Scutnik, are capable of ruling themselves without dictates of priests or kings and are capable of helping themselves on the way through wise and just laws. I think that's the philosophy of the Constitution. It's insufficiently ideological for the modern debate, but I think if you had sat down and gotten Alexander Hamilton and James Madison drunk together, they could have agreed on that and disagreed on how to apply it. That's why they could be allies in the Federalists and enemies after the Federalists. And I just discoursed on the Federalist before Federalist scholar, so I'm going to be berated over dinner how <laughs> ignorant I am. But I can't kill my parents and throw myself on the mercy of the court as an orphan, so I have to show chutzpah somehow. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm the cameraman once, so let's do two. Bo both, of you, both of you guys back here. I've never had a cameraman ask a question before, so I don't want to... Potential to embody that. I mean, I know yeah. Benjamin Carson and Rubio and, and Chris Christie and all those guys that are talking about, but I mean, yeah. is there it, someone else that we should be looking for? Is there, you know, I, I always get asked the who question, and I never answer the who question. And the reason why is because it's unknowable. Is there anybody that I could look out and say, yeah, I think they've got it 100%? They've walked the walk, they talk the talk, they get it from head to toe, no. Do I think there's a lot of people who are, have elements of it? Yeah. Do I think it's gonna take time and discussion and people figuring out uh, both the calculus and what's in their heart and in their soul to get to that point? Yeah. Do I th hold out that there's a possibility that someone we've never heard of is going to become a major figure? I mean, who the heck heard of Chris Christie five years ago? I mean, geeks did, like me, but I mean, Average people didn't. Um, who was Scott Walker? He was an obscure uh, local county official. I don't even think he really knew the political whirlwind that he was going to set off with his first budget because, after all, he had done it in Milwaukee, taking away collective bargaining rights when he was county executive and nobody struck, struck against him. Why wouldn't it work here? The fact is he showed great political skill in handling a crisis that was only partially of his own making. Uh, and now he's a potential candidate for the presidency. We never know in American politics, what's going to happen. And we shouldn't try and pretend that we do. I don't. Oh, they, it wasn't just social issues. What they, you know, it was very, it was very, very strategic. I mean, I don't have an inner, it's not like I got on the phone to Chicago and said, hey guys, give me the dirt. You know, I'm, I'm a Republican who, who, who actually cares more about analysis than about party. Um, I can infer things by looking at them as somebody who actually ran campaigns. And you know, you look and uh, you're, you're po it's, you have to start with a strategy early. You, you're uh, between 45 and 47 percent in the polls uh, in February or March. Uh, you just got shellacked in the last election. Um, there's very little likelihood, given everything you've tried, you know, you've spent the last 14 months trying to rehab rehabilitate the president's image and barely budged it. Um, it's just not reasonable to think that you're probably going to get above 50% of the vote on your own accord. So you have to figure, okay, if I can't win on my own accord, I've got to tear down the other guy. How am I going to tear down the other guy? Well, you look at their weaknesses. It was obvious. It was just obvious. So they chose the wedge issues really in some ways, it was completely obvious. I mean, immigration for Hispanics was an obvious one. Uh, but, you know, the contraception one required a real 
cunning that, as a practitioner of the black arts, I kind of admire. What I would have done if I was Romney, the contraception issue actually arose before the mandate question. It arose when Rick Santorum's speeches about contraception came into the public view. And basically, at that moment, what Romney should have done is personally or through his wife stand up and say, I'm for a woman's right to choose her own, the most important thing, which is her own self-determination. And I, you know, my wife and I chose one lifestyle, others chose other lifestyles. Contraception is absolutely central to a woman's ability to achieve the American dream in the 21st century, and I believe it should be safe, I believe it should be legal, I believe it's morally right, and my opponent doesn't. I think if he had done that, he would have thrown the stake through the heart of the Santorum campaign, and he would have come out as somebody who was perceived as standing up to an interest in his party. Now, the thing is, evangelicals don't care about contraception. That's only a hardcore Catholic issue. And it's really only an issue among the hardest core of the hardest core. If he had done that, the whole religious mandate question would have been invalid because he would have established his bona fides as somebody who clearly believed in what the important issue was, which was, once I say, and clearly say, I believe in your right to choose what's important, which is control your body so that you can control your life, then you have credibility. You're Nixon, you go to China. Then you can say, but since I believe that, now let's talk about what they're trying to do. And it's not that. It's something else. He ducked it. And he lost the presidency on that day. Thanks. We have a nice reception uh, outside for you. I hope you'll stick around um, and enjoy that. Off to uh, Henry, Kelsey, each other, keep the conversation going. Thank you.